In the previous lectures, we introduced the basic concepts of shear stress in beams. We talked about uh, how to calculate shear stress at a certain point. And today, I would like to develop that concept to thin walled elements. To review the concept, let me show you this. We mentioned in the last lecture that shear stress problems can be categorized into three main categories. The first is the basic concept of simple shear stress at a, in a simple shapes, like a rectangular shape or a circular shape. For this kind of problems, we use this equation. Shear stress is VQ over IT. This is the basic equation that we use for solving this kind of problems. The topic that I want to focus on is this kind of problems, which we call them thin-walled elements. Thin-walled elements are those elements which have thin thickness compared to their height and width, as we can see over here. They might be uh, open thin-walled elements, as we see on top, or closed thin-walled elements, as we see on the bottom. We will cover how to calculate shear stress and shear flow in these kind of sections. We use the same equation as we used before on the next lecture on Thursday, which would be the finishing topic of shear stress problems. We will talk about built-up members, and for this kind of problems, we use another equation, and that, again, we developed that equation on the first lecture of shear stress problems, and that is delta F is delta MQ over I. Delta F is the unbalanced force, okay? Or sometimes we use this version of that equation, which is VQ over I times delta S. These two equations are equivalent to each other. Okay, so now let me focus on this kind of problems. Thin walled elements. In thin walled elements, the basic equation is VQ over IT. That equation gives us the value of shear stress at a certain point. V is shear force, I is moment of inertia, Q is the first moment of area, and T is thickness of the cut section. In addition to shear stress, we sometimes use shear flow. Shear flow is simply shear stress times thickness. We use Q for that, and that is tau times T, and that the equation for determining that would be simply VQ over I. Shear flow is pretty similar to flow of a liquid, flow of water in a channel. Let me consider that this is like a river. There is one river on top, which starts in one branch from the right side and another branch from the left side, and they are joining together at this point, at the middle point. What would be the shear flow at this point? These two channels are joining together at this point, so the shear flow is increasing. When I get to the centroid, again, the shear flow is increasing, increasing up to the maximum point, which is located at the centroid. And after that, shear flow is decreasing. And when I get to this point on the bottom, the shear flow is actually splitting into two parts. So it is half at that point going to the left, left and on the right. And it is uh, equal to zero on the very right end, bottom, and on the very left and bottom of this shape. So this is how shear stress flows across the section. There are some facts about shear stress and shear flow. Let me review important facts here. First, in calculation of shear stress, V and I are constant across a section. So shear force is determined for one section. It doesn't matter what is the point at which you are determining the shear stress. It is variable across the length of beam, definitely, but it, it would be constant in one section. Similar would be for I. Moment of inertia is not determined for certain point, but it is determined for the entire section. That is not the case for Q. Q is determined for one point. Okay, so it does depend on what is the point at which you are determining shear stress. The same is true for thickness. Consider this shape. If thickness of top element, which we call it flange, is different from the vertical element, the thickness of vertical element, which we call it web. If my point is located on the flange, I need to consider the thickness of flange. If the point is located here on the web, I need to consider the thickness of the web. So thickness is not constant. That is a big difference between these kind of shapes and the shape that we had on the previous lecture. So the tricky part would be how to calculate Q and how to calculate T. 
Another important fact about shear stress and shear flow is, you remember uh, in the previous lecture, I said that shear stress is always maximum at the centroid. Do you remember this? Why? Because Q is always maximum at that point. This is not the case for thin walled elements. Why? <laughs> Look at this equation, VQ over IT. V is constant for the section. I is constant for the section. Q is variable. So why the maximum shear stress is not always at the centroid? Because of T. Because T might be too large at the centroid. That reduces down the value of shear stress at that point. Okay? So I need to see at which point I have the highest Q over T ratio. Or to get rid of that, I can use shear flow concept. Because shear flow, which doesn't consider thickness, is always maximum at the centroid. So that is another reason we sometimes use shear flow instead of the shear stress. So shear flow is always maximum at the centroid, but this is not the case for shear stress for thin walled elements. Shear stress might be maximum in the horizontal element in the flange instead of the web. The important tricky part about solving thin walled element is how to calculate Q and how to calculate T for this kind of shapes. For vertical element, let me show one section here. Can you see this green point here? If I want to determine Q for this point, as we said before, we cut it parallel to the axis of interest, which in this case is Z, and we consider the entire area above this line, and we determine Q for that. Q would be simply A times D. A would be area of this shape, and D would be distance of centroid of this subsection to the centroid of the entire section. And Q would be simply A times D. Now, what would be Q and T if the point is located on this horizontal element, on the flange element? Let me consider another point. I'm using another color to separate that from this point. How can I consider Q and how can I cut my section? For this kind of problems, for thin walled elements, we cut our section perpendicular to the direction of the element. So in this case, I'm going to cut my section in this way. So area would be area of this hatch section, and D would be distance of that hatch section from the centroid of the entire section. Why we are considering that? Why we are cutting our section in the vertical direction for this case? Look at this figure. <coughs> Let me consider I want to determine shear stress at point B. Try to remember the concepts that we used before for the developing VQ over T equation. What was the concept? We determined unbalanced force. That unbalanced force came from the normal stress on the right and normal stress on the left. Okay? And where that unbalanced force was acting on? That unbalanced force was acting on the cut section where your element is connected to the rest of element. Now for point B, how can I cut my element? How can I make it separated from the rest of element? To cut this point and separate it from the rest of element, we need to cut that in the vertical direction. And that would be our cut section, section number one here. And that delta F, that unbalanced force, is acting on this side. So I need to consider area of this side in calculating the shear stress. Okay, so every problem that I want to talk about today in thin walled element is about where should I cut my section, how to calculate Q, and how to calculate thickness for that section.